Golden Horse. Why not Brooklyn Golden Horse? Because Eddie Taylor came from Texas. Dallas, Texas. Say, Copy, got anything for me? Nope. You don't expect to get anything for that place. Not on the Dallas News, do you, Eddie? That's good. I, I'm kind of busy here anyhow. Who are you kidding? Copy! I'll see you. Give this to Taylor. It might interest him. Yes, sir. Copy. Got something for you. Yeah, for me? San Angelo's your hometown, isn't it? Yeah. Got a story here, just came in. About old T.X. Taylor. Any relation of yours? My grandfather. Says here he's dead. He was a very old man. Left an inheritance, huh? Yeah. His own private money belt and a couple of 1875 Colt revolvers. Well, he remembered me. I'd forgotten him. Seems he didn't believe in banks, so he left me $6,000 in cash in his money belt. Copy! I'll see you. Mr. McGonagall? Yeah? This is my last day here. Quitting? Since the first day I came here, three years ago, I've been waiting until I had enough money to do what I really want to do. Money? Your grandfather left you $6,000, not sixty. dollars That's enough. What are you going to do with this enormous fortune? Buy a ranch half the size of Texas? I'm going to New York to finish my play. Uh-huh. Well, when your smash hit pops on Broadway, the Fort Worth section will still be open. On the Dallas News? That's right. <laughs> no, thanks. So long, McGonagall. So long. Well, good luck. Eddie, 
got off to a swell start. 26 miles out of Dallas, he had car trouble. But if there had been no car trouble... Hey, mister, would you give me a lift, please? I'm not very heavy. Where did you come from? I was asleep there beside the road, and then I heard you making all that noise. I guess it woke me. Go away. You're a very rude person. You're not a nice girl. Out on the highway this time of the night. There's nothing nice about you either, not a single iota. It so happens I'm running away from home. Some people do it in style, some have to do it my way. So for your information, I am a nice girl. And now, if you'll excuse me, good night. with all that racket you're making. I'm sorry my car broke down in your boudoir. If you had one iota of friendliness, just one iota, I could fix your car for you. That I'd like to see. Thanks for fixing my car. You've already said that four times. I'm only trying to make conversation. Please don't exert yourself. I'm sure it must be very exhausting for you to try to be nice. I'm a fellow who's always been alone. Even when I work with others, I'm still alone. I'm not used to helping or being helped. Isn't it funny that I should be running away from the ranch when that's what I like most of all? What ranch? Oh, didn't I tell you? It's the family ranch in Texas. It's just outside of Kalinimo City. And it covers about 115,000 acres. And you should see the horses we have. 2,800 of them, not counting the wild mares and their foals. Look, miss, I know Kalinimo City pretty well. There isn't a horse ranch within 200 miles of that place, and we both know it. Yeah, but if there was such a place, wouldn't it be wonderful? What are you really running away from? A gasoline station. That's why I know so much about cars. My brother and I ran it till he got married, and then when his wife moved in, I felt sort of unnecessary. You know, like I was crowding the place. Still, it's better than bucking the world on you. Unless you have a grandfather who left you a hunk of dough. All I have is a diploma from the correspondence school. It's a very attractive diploma, though, and it says I'm a perfect secretary. Shorthand, typing, and business management. You've got a job waiting for you someplace, huh? No, but I'll get one. And then when I've made enough money, I'll come back to Texas and buy myself a ranch with horses. All the loveliest horses. You haven't told me anything about yourself. You've been awfully quiet. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a very special bulletin. Red Carr is still at large. Red Carr, who robbed another bank in East Texas this morning, was last seen steaming away in a fast black coupe. Up to 10 minutes ago, he had not been apprehended. Special warning to anyone who might see him. Red Car always carries at least two heavy caliber revolvers. Approach with caution. What kind of work do you do? Oh, I'm going to New York to write a play. You still haven't told me your name, or, or uh, would you rather not? Taylor. Eddie Taylor. How do you spell the Taylor? T-A-Y-L-O-E. My name is Peruna Dunklin. I spell the Dunklin. D-U-N-K. Watch out! <laughs> Put those guns down. They might go off. Thank goodness you've come out of it. I thought it was the sheriff and the posse. Sheriff? But it was only Mr. Tebow and the doctor. Now, think quick. They'll be in here in a minute. We'll use the name you gave me last night, Eddie Taylor. That's what I've already told them your name is. Are you listening to me? I'm listening. My name is Eddie Taylor. Good. And I'm your sister, Perry. My sister? It makes it look better. Red Carr wouldn't be riding around with his sister. What's Red Carr got to do with this? Who are you? Eddie Taylor. 
That's fine. And don't worry about your money, Doc. I put it under the couch. I can Mr. Siegel help me get you in the bed, lad. I'm getting out of here, right now. What happened to my shoulder? You're lucky you're alive. I don't know. And who's this Mr. Tebow? This is his house. He lives here alone. His wife ran away with the dentist. But he doesn't carry since, because now he doesn't have to pay the bill. Anyway, he helped me get you here after the accident. You remember the accident, don't you? Remember it. I'm still in it. It's getting worse. And we're so fortunate that Mr. Tebow didn't recognize you. Let's get something straight. I'm not Red Carr. Of course not. You're Eddie Taylor. We agreed on that, didn't we? It's not a matter of agreement. I am Eddie Taylor. And I'm your sister. I have no sister. You better have one if you know what's good for you. Hello, Doctor. Hello, Miss... Uh, uh, Taylor. Perry Taylor. And, uh... You? I'm Red Carr. You've heard about me, Doc. Haven't you? Uh, why, uh, everybody around these parts knows about Red Car. What are you nodding your head for? Don't you believe I'm Red Car, don't you? Yeah. And now, perhaps it would be better if I talk to the patient alone. <laughs> it's his left shoulder, Doctor. Uh, we'll know soon enough. I'll call you if I need you. Try to behave. Get in touch with the rest of the mob. Tell them to lay low until the heat's off. Oh! You got a good buy in this car, Eddie. You did the buy. 400 miles and the motor sounds like a hummingbird. You still getting off at Birmingham? Sure, if your shoulder's okay. Why don't you stay with me and... Or is that too big for you? I hadn't figured on New York. Why not make it New York? It's about time somebody like you went there and changed the place. Well, I don't know. Perry. Yes? My shoulder doesn't bother me anymore. It hasn't hurt me for the last two days. Uh, I didn't say anything because, well, what I mean is, you're a good driver. You mustn't fall in love with me. Who said anything about... Spoil everything. What makes you think I give up? Y you must admit there's always the possibility that you might want for us to become sweethearts. You, you admit that possibility? True? Well, you must fight that possibility. It'll be a struggle. A love affair at this time would interfere with my plans. You see, Eddie, I've always lived in a world of... Well, call it make-believe. But one thing is a reality. I have a great capacity for love. For people. For all kinds of people. Oh, I could fall in love, but that would be selfish of me. I, I feel I sort of owe it to those people to kind of ration out my affection. So that's why you must deny yourself the prospect of loving me. When the time comes that I feel I've done all I can do for others, when that time comes, then perhaps we can sit down and talk things over. Goody. I don't care whether you're laughing at me or not. That's the way I feel about everything, and this is the first time I've had an opportunity to do anything about it. So please, be strong, show character, and don't fall in love with me. Perry. Yes? Do me a favor. Go ahead. Shut up. What are you going to do, walk out on me right now? You said you showed us okay? Well, I'm a little tired. You drive for a while. After all, it's a long way to New York. Six states, she talked his ears off. Of course, Perry knew he wasn't Red Carr. But she kept up a rack just for the fun of watching him blow his stuff. And all the time, he didn't know that she was giving him the needle. Mm. It's funny how some gals know just when to use reversed English. Well, anyway, it's not expensive like the others. 
It'll make a good hideout. For the last time, I don't need a hideout. Well, goodbye. I hope you finish your play pretty soon. Thanks for everything. But you rush. Let's have breakfast first and talk things over. We've had plenty of time to talk. Now I'm on my way to Brooklyn. Brooklyn? Did you come all the way to New York to end up in Brooklyn? I, I've heard so much about it. It sounds like a truly wondrous place. What's so wondrous about it? Brooklyn appeals to me. Is there any reason why I shouldn't make it my destination? Well, that's not a logical question. I can't give you a logical answer. Well, goodbye. I hate to see you rush off like that. Eddie, you're being romantic. I give up. In plain and simple language, goodbye. Will you get in touch with me when you get settled? All right, Eddie. Let me have a room and bath, please. Hey. 105. I'm not a bellhop, you understand. I'm a kind of a general all around everything. A bellhop would starve to death in a flea bag like this. Present company excluded, the customers here are anti-tipping. That's why I gotta be illegal to make a living. Like I take small bets from the horse playing set. I got a regular clientele. You can become a member. Where's the phone? No phone. A hotel without a telephone? Downstairs near the bar, there is a public phone for the accommodation of the guests. That's very accommodating. Frankly, it's a plot against the customers to make them drink. You see, every time you go down to answer the phone, you buy a drink. Well, what if I don't want a drink? Don't be a character. You get into the habit. That's why Mr. Simpson yanked all the phones out of the rooms. Let them do their phoning in the bar, he said. That'll make them drink. Understand the psychology? Well, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I don't understand the psychology. Look, I'll explain it to you very simple. Say you're a guy and you answer the phone and it's your girl and she says, Harry, take it like a man. From now on, Joe has took your place in my heart forevermore. What is Harry gonna do? There is a bar, all laid out for him. Congenial company and a bartender will listen to anything. What is Harry gonna do? And it doesn't make any difference whether it's his girlfriend or it's the boss or even if it's the bookie trying to collect a bet. Good news or bad news, he's bound to take a drink. Sometimes to forget, sometimes to remember. And then there's, a, there's the nervous type. He's got to have a drink before he answers the phone. This type Maybe you don't have to work, but I do. A writer. Do you mind? A regular character. If anybody calls you... Nobody's going to call me. But if I get a call from Brooklyn, and it's a girl, uh, nobody's gonna call me. But if anybody does, I'll come up and get you. You don't have to worry about tipping me. I make my money illegal, but legitimate. Only, I gotta figure you out first. Yes, yes. We'll do everything we possibly can. Goodbye. And now, Miss Taylor, what kind of room would you like and what district? You know the YWCA may not be able to find it for you. I'd like to live in the loft of a stable. A stable. Did you say you wanted to live in a stable? Yes, please. If it isn't too much trouble. You're aware that there might be horses in that stable? Oh, yes, of course. I'd favor a stable with horses in it. But if you can't find one with a horse in it, I'd still favor a stable, even if it was empty. Oh, well, 
and out. That makes it much simpler. I thought... I hoped that I would be able to find such a place here. After all, this is Brooklyn, so naturally... Right? Oh, yes, naturally. Uh -huh. <laughs> naturally. Naturally. Share this with me. Thank you. Delighted, my dear. Delighted. Is anything wrong? There's nothing, my dear. See, nothing of it. It's an allergy that I've developed ever since coming up north. I don't know what it is, and I've been to dozens and dozens of doctors. My dear child, I am ashamed of myself. You'd never think I used to be able to empty a purse with a hand as light as a goose feather. But you could have asked. I ask no one. And anyway, with my police record, I shouldn't even be seen on the streets. By the way, honey, before you call the coppers, would you treat me to a meal, and a mere gesture? And I promised not to run away. I couldn't... Uh, I... But you gotta answer some questions. Why? Because you have a pencil and a notebook? Because it's the law. I've told you, she doesn't feel well. Now, isn't that enough? Okay, we'll let it go at that. Now, how about a nice, clean ambulance? None of that, dear boy. No ambulance. But you're sick, lady. Why make her sicker? Ambulance, hospitals, a lot of questions. I know the whole routine. Very unhealthy, all those questions. Okay, then just give the facts. What's your name? Perry Taylor. You know, I think that the thing for you... Mind if I get the facts. T-A-Y-L-O. Adney. And the lady? Ever seen her before? Enough of this. Child, I don't want to burden you with... Oh, dear. Send for the wagon. No, they should send you home. Two will get you five. She hasn't even got a home. She hasn't you got a home. And how would you know? Because... Because she's my mother. Oh. Your mother, huh? What kind of a daughter are you not to feed your own flesh and blood? Because she was too proud and independent to accept help. And then one day she ran away from home to see what she could pick up on her own. I didn't catch up with her until today. She didn't want to be a burden on me. Or on my brother. You see, I have a brother, too. His name is Edward Taylor, and he lives at the Grand National Hotel. She's his mother, too. Now, that makes everything fine, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, you're going to take her home with you and take care of her? Of course. And your address, uh, Grand National? No, no, it's 9006 Flatbush Place. Not the house itself, the stable. 9006 Flatbush Place. Now you're doing the right thing. And where do you live? Oh, I don't want to get mixed up in this. I was just waiting for a downtown express, but uh, I'll take a local. Sweet girls, please say something. My daughter and I have answered all of your questions. How much longer do we have to stand here? Maybe they don't want us to rent the stable lot. We do. You appear to be satisfactory. You don't drink, you don't smoke. And you're not given to entertaining gentlemen callers. Very satisfactory. Then we can have it? Yes. We'll show it to you. Come 
I'm in. Telephone for you. For me? The police department. Well, it's a gag. Why should the police want me? Don't be disturbed, character. When the police use the telephone, it can't be anything serious. Maybe they just want you to, to identify a corpse. It's okay, you can go that way. We're informal here. This is Eddie Tiller speaking. My mother. Well, if my sister Perry told you that, you can take her word for it. Yes, sir. I'll see to it that my mother is properly fed from now on. Another telephone call. Your sister. Tell her. Tell her that I. I'll take it. Hello. Now look, Perry, I'm get. Yes, the police call me. No. They didn't fingerprint me. Listen, Perry, how can you get yourself into so much trouble in so short a time? There's been no trouble, not one iota. As a matter of fact, I have something good to tell you. I found a wonderful mother for you. But I don't want a mother. But Red Car needs a mother. Don't you understand the psychology? I don't care if Red Car needs a mother. I'm trying to write a play. All right, but don't get hysterical just because I was trying to help a, a nice lady who was hungry. So I arranged to have our mother stay with me. Go on, give me the facts. Now, if you'll promise not to get mad, I'll explain something about our mother. You see, many years ago, she had a sort of uh, a tendency to, um, to pick pockets. Did you say that our sweet, loving mother has a notorious pickpocket with a long prison record? Will you or will you not stand by me? Of course I'll stand by you. What else am I gonna do? But, Barry, please, can't you get yourself involved in something simple? Like a triple murder. Oh, Eddie, I'm terribly sorry I've been such a burden to you. And you have my solemn word that I'll never do anything to make you angry or upset you again. Okay, Perry, okay. I'm not angry with you. Hello? Hello, Perry? Perry? Hello? Hello? Let me have a double... Never mind. I'm Eddie Taylor. I'm expected, I believe. These are my sisters, Miss Pearl Cheever and Miss Opal Cheever. How do you do? He doesn't resemble his mother. He doesn't resemble his sister. No. Oh, I have to take after my, my father. Oh. We do not permit smoking here. I'm sorry. We're very disagreeable. Everyone in the neighborhood says we're mean and spiteful. And utterly selfish. And we are. Yes. Uh, I'm sure you're not. We do not deny the truth. We're most unpleasant indeed. And we'd rather you didn't go around Brooklyn saying nice things about us. No. 
My son, my dear, dear son. It's been so long, my darling boy. You may use the sitting room. Thank you, dear girl. Come along, my sweet. Remember, no smoking. Excuse us, please, dear girl. You could have called me mother. But I wanted to call you a lot of things. But that triple threat out there stopped me cold. Shh. I called you about Perry. Well, it's about time. If I'd known this address, I would have been here three weeks ago. Well, Perry didn't want to get in touch with you until she had a job. Now she's got a job. Why didn't she call me? Well, it's a strange kind of a job she's got, my boy. If this job is something you got her, if you're getting her mixed up in something crooked... Just I'll... look who's talking. I may have lifted a lever now and then, but I never pulled a bank job. But for Perry's sweet sake, your secret shall remain locked deep within my heart. What about Perry's job? What's wrong? That's why I thought we'd drop down and watch her while she's at work. Then you can decide what course of action to take. Oh, can't you tell me about it? Where's she working? Coney Island. And imagine we can get some hot dogs while we're there. Come along, my sweet. Will you be back, Mrs. Taylor? Oh, in an hour, two or three. And thanks for a most unpleasant time. You must come again, Mr. Taylor. Oh, I will. Anytime I want to get depressed. We should have listened in on their conversation. We should have. Next time we will. under the impression you sold hot dogs here. Well, speak up, buddy. I can't read your mind. Here, yeah, get your hot dogs. Everybody likes them. Only ten to a customer, mustard. No. Take it or leave it, buddy. In this business, we got a short season. Excuse me, sir. I didn't mean to offend you. Ah, oh, the Park Avenue type. Here, yeah, get your Coney Island hot dogs. Everybody eats them. Everybody likes them. Well, I told you I didn't want another hot dog. Well, don't eat it. I'm just trying to keep both your hands occupied. Yeah, he, he'll hold these for me a minute. Hey, excuse, excuse me. me. Excuse me. Excuse me. I know that little guy. He didn't recognize me, but I spotted him right away. He's called Doc because he looks like a nerve specialist. One of the smoothest operators in the profession. Your profession? Uh-huh. By the way, you better look and see if you still got your wallet. <laughs> I knew he was lifting levels the minute he bumped into you. And I suppose you lifted it from him to prove to me that you've reformed. No, child. I just want to see if my technique is better than the dark. Maybe I didn't prepare it. I wish you wouldn't say I'd reform. It makes me feel so old and useless. I mean, you're a child. I give you the greatest entertainment value on the Midway. Ziggy's internationally famous water name. This is it. What's Perry doing in there? We're down here to find out. And I hope she can swim. Presenting the water name. There they are, everybody. Ain't they out of this world? And each one born and bred in Brooklyn. Look at that fairy! Say, she's all right! All girls are not only gorgeous, they're daredevils. As you will soon see for yourselves behind these clown walls. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have you meet the girls personally. Honey, 
Tell the folks your name. Jean Dean. Linda Lombard. Meryl Nemes. Mill Patrick. Joe George. Jean Stratton. And you, honey. Hey, you. Hey, you. My name is Perry. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Perry Pace Kane. <laughs> Keep your hands off of her. Go away, Sonny. You bother me. <laughs> Right down this way, folks. Come on down, right down this way. The biggest show on the Midway. Come on down, folks. The biggest show on the Midway. The show is going on now. Right this way, folks. The biggest show on the Midway. See the fire eater, folks. Come on down, right down this way, folks. Come on down. Keep a jump over the beautiful Chinese temple dancers. Tickets right this way, folks. Go right in. Right over this way. I'm obliged to you, Eddie, even though you made me lose my job. I'm obliged to you because I know you meant well. But in the future, please let me pick my own jobs and you stick to your playwriting. Oh, what's the use? I give up. Here. Call it a loan or, or whatever you want. You'll need it until you get another job. Well, thank you, but I'm not looking for charity. Hey, mother of mine. Here, you try to give it to her. Well, she said she didn't want it. I know, but you're slick enough to figure out a way of getting it to her. Or are you going to get high hat on me, too? Frankly, yes. We, and I speak for my daughter and myself, want no further interference from you. <laughs> I told you, Mr. Arco never does musicals. Junior, how many times do I have to tell you to keep that phone off the hook when I'm trying to eat? Eating? Yeah, I was having a little snack in there, but, but I've got a very sensitive stomach, and I can't eat a thing with the phone so ringing. So you mean to tell me that you've been eating all the time I've been waiting? Junior? Yeah? Who is this man? He wrote a play. I returned it to him, but he insisted on a personal interview with you. I told him you'd be tied up for at least an hour. And all that time you were only eating. Well, why not? I didn't bother you when you were working on your play, did I? Why do you feel that you should bother me when I'm trying to eat? Oh, stop that. This is no beauty parlor. Now, do you mind if I return to my chicken sandwich on white toast with no dressing? Wait a minute. Before you go, I would like to know something. In fact, I've reached the point where I must know. You see, everybody on Broadway has turned down my play. Now that... I've exhausted the field. I've got to know. Should I try to write another play? Well, I never read your play. You know, well, how could you turn it down? Because Junior didn't like it. Junior didn't like it? How could you let a, a thing like that pass judgment on my play? Now, wait a minute, son. Take it easy. Junior has an uncanny eye for anything that looks like a potential hit play. Why, he could get a million jobs tomorrow any place on Broadway. But he's my son, and I won't let him go. Junior, tell the gentleman if he has any talent. I don't care what he thinks. Well, you ask me a question. Junior will have to answer you. I can't. All right, I'll take his opinion. So, Eddie asked Junior. But even Junior didn't like it. Nobody liked it. Eddie was a bust. When I met up with him, Eddie had fire coming out of his eyes and smoke coming out of his ears. Hold it, Mike. You better hitch up that third horse. What's more?
What's more with what? What's more with the story? How many times does that horse have to kick me before I get the end? Mm -hmm. So far, pal, you've only been riding side saddle. Now we really go places, because here's where I met up with Eddie. You remember the bellhop? Well, Eddie tried to pass that bar once too often. It was the night that Joe was sick and had asked me to stand in for him. Bartender. Barton. Good evening. Sorry to keep you waiting. We're just getting ready to close up. Okay, what do you have? Poison. <laughs> what kind of a chaser? Don't be a comedian. Give me a bourbon and water. A bourbon and water. You can call me Mike. Why? <laughs> That's my name. Oh. I want a bourbon. Yeah, I know. But I want you to try one of these. It's a little concoction of my own. Look, I ordered a straight bourbon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> But just try one of these. Now, can I have a straight bourbon? Good, huh? What do they call this drink? Golden horse. Okay, Mike. Let me have another golden horse. <laughs> You're new around here, aren't you, Mike? Hmm? You're new around here. Oh, yeah, I'm only here for the evening. Joe has a cold. Oh, say, Mike, how do you make this uh, golden horse? Well, first a little dab of Texas sunshine, then some rain. A little hail. Gotta have some hail. <laughs> some snow. A couple of earthquakes. Then you make a very tiny waterfall out of it. Just a little teensy one. And you top it off with some good old Mother Earth. <laughs> I like you, Mike. You've got a great sense of humor. Pour one for yourself. Thanks, Eddie. How'd you know my name was Eddie? Oh, um, he told me when you first came in. Oh. Eddie really tied one on that night. Six hours and 12 bars later, I got the whole story. How he cost Perry a job and how he was the world's worst playwright. Along with it, I got the idea that there might be something I could do for these kids. The smart thing first. Got Eddie sobered up the easy way. Flat on his back in Prospect Park. Mike. Mike? <laughs> How is it, Eddie? Oh. New world's record for a hangover. <laughs> well, the Turkish bath ought to help you a lot. There's one near here, too. Best Turkish bath in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. A truly wondrous place. I thought you'd like it. At Prospect Park. Oh. Oh, I could lie here for hours. It's like Texas, without the sagebrush. You know what I need? A long ride on a horse. That picks me up. Well, let's try the Turkish bath first. And while we're there, you can get your clothes clean. Then if you want, you can rent a horse. I'll go along with you on that Turkish bath deal. The horse is off. It'll be pouring here in a few minutes. I wouldn't take a mule out in such weather. Say, I know where we can rent a horse and the rain won't even touch us. And you can have any kind of a gait you want, fast or slow, or one that'll rock you like a baby in a cradle. And you can have your Texas sagebrush, too. 
Where is this heavenly spot? Right here in Brooklyn. <laughs> this Brooklyn is truly a wondrous place. <laughs> The Turkish bath was one thing, but this I don't believe. Here I get to ride a horse through sagebrush? Come on, Eddie. So I took him to Mr. Gabulian's Riding Academy. <laughs> it was strictly out of this world, and that included Mr. Gabulian. He was a whacked up guy, a, a fugitive from Ripley. Wow. What is it, a zoo? Mike? A man of your word. It's all here. But I'm wondering if I am. Well, it was a place a man could go when he got fed up working nine to five. But two bits of Mr. Kabulian's, he could live dangerous. Sail the seven seas and track down wild game. <laughs> yeah, the academy was something. And it was just what the doctor ordered for the kid. Soon as Eddie got one foot inside the place, I could see his troubles begin to peel off. I'll give you your choice of any horse in the place. <laughs> Use that one. Sorry to disturb you. <laughs> Meet my friend Eddie. Eddie and I want to ride your horses. Excuse me, gentlemen. The rain was so heavy, so I think nobody comes. So I have me sleep in the howdah on the elephant. Excuse, gentlemen, please. Please. What's he doing up there? Huh? <laughs> That's Captain Lars Jean. He was a real skipper once. That boat teaches you not to become seasick, huh? <laughs> I guess so. in my life. This is really a beaut. Good afternoon, Mr. McWhorter. Good day to you. It's a miserable day out. Oh, sure. It's good that you are here. He owns a nice bird store on Fulton Street. <laughs> so every day he rides the camel. He looks like he's having a lot of fun. A lot of fun? That's the only thing that makes him happy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is to start. When you like it fast, move forward. Boy, Perry would really love this. You'd go crazy with this machine. <laughs> Yes. 
I want to make your business proposition. You see? I want you to hire a young girl to help you run this place. Maybe I better wash my face. My eyes, maybe they are open, but my mind is asleep. Excuse me, please. Mr. Gabulian. Yes? She'd be wonderful for you. She, she loves horses, and, and she could fix any mechanical gadget in case something should go wrong. <laughs> you make a joke. Excuse me, please. Mr. Gabulian. And yes? I mean it most seriously. She would be a real help. Help me what, sir, please? Help me not to see a customer? Help me not to pay the rent? Help me not eat like a man should eat? Help me that way, mister? No, it's not right. You shouldn't make fun of me. Excuse me, I go back to sleep. Mr. Gabulian. Yes? I know you can't afford it. So I'll give you her salary every week, and then you can pay her. Well, in other words, she'll be getting the job on her own. Understand? Why should I go back to sleep? I stand here and I sleep already. Don't you see? This girl needs a job. And I want her to have this one. Here. Or you'll have someone to help you. And it'll cost you nothing. It will cost me nothing? Absolutely nothing. I'll even pay for the ad in the paper. Wanted. Young girl from Texas. Must know and love all kinds of horses. Must be honor graduate of correspondence course. Now, remember, the only one you hire is Perry Taylor. Perry Taylor? I'll, I'll write it all out for you later. What have you got to lose? Just think, Mr. Gabulian, you can sleep as much as you want. I think it's over. What is there to think about? Nothing. Only it makes it sound like better business. So I think it over for a minute, please. Then I give you my answer, which will be yes. Swell. Now, we each put in a nickel to begin with. That's my girl. Now, let me see your hand. Now, you remember you all promised Perry you'd learn to play games. You know how anxious she is to liven up the place. And how are you going to play poker if you don't let me teach you? That's my girl. Well, you have a very bad poker hand here. Two, four, seven, ten jacks. It's nothing at all. But if I were you, I'd hold on to this jack, because that's your highest card, see? And ask for four more cards. I'd gladly give them to you. Nice, fresh, new one. Now, no, you hold on to that, dear. Now, Ruby, let me see what you have. Why, that's wonderful. You've got a pair of fours. Now, if I get a pair of twos or threes, you'll beat me, you see? <laughs> you see how simple it is to play poker? Now, dear, let's see what you have. Oh. Uh, well, you have a very good hand, dear. Uh, three queens and a pair of aces. A uh, very good hand indeed. Poker, one must always try to improve one's hand. So, I'll throw away these two aces. And try to buy another queen, because four queens, you see, would give you a perfectly lovely hand. Now, we'll each put in another nickel in order to buy a fresh card. Come along. Oh, how I wish Perry were here to see you at play. Now, three for you. One, two, three. And two for you. One, two. And four for you. One, two, three, four. Now, I'm not taking anything. That's what's called standing pat. Now, we'll all show our hands in order to see who's won. Well, now, come, come, girl. If we don't show our hands, how are we going to know who's the lucky girl? And the lucky one wins all the money in the center of the table. Now, now, I have a straight. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, you remember what I told you about a straight? I'm going to be awfully hard to beat. Awfully hard. But that's the game of poker for you. That's what makes it so terribly exciting. Now, let's see, dearest, what you have. Come along. Oh, you poor, unlucky thing. I haven't got anything. Not even a pair. Now, let's see what you have, dear. Well, you still have only a pair of fours. That doesn't beat a straight. Now, dearest, let's see what you have. Four, 
floor clean. Four of a kind beats us straight. That's what you taught us. I sure enough taught you that. I sure enough did. Well, we'll have to try another time. I've got a job, a new job, a wonderful job, a most heavenly job. Oh, good news is always good news. I'm so happy for you, darling. It's just what I've always wanted. Horses and a camel and an elephant and a lot of other things. I didn't know the circus was in town. It isn't. We always know when it comes. We always get free passes from our grocer, Mr. Brickle. No, no, no. It's a riding academy. And all the animals are mechanical. But they're so lifelike, they're practically real. And I'm to be executive manager. Isn't that too good to be true? Oh, no. But I've got to have a riding habit. I wouldn't look as if I were running the place unless I did. You know, I've noticed that our dear, dear Chiva sisters are very handy with a sewing machine. We've never made a riding habit. Only Mother Hubbard's. And slip covers. Yes, but under my supervision, dear girls, you'll make a riding habit. A more than suitable riding habit. But first, let's return all the losings to the losers. You were the only loser. Well, I guess I'll have to teach you how to play gin rummy. There were about 50 other girls for the job, but I got it. All in all, those three ghouls downstairs took me for eight bucks and 40 cents. I tried blackjack, casino, double solitaire. I even invented a game and called it Chuck Full of Luck. But that's a commodity on which the Chiva sisters seem to have a monopoly. But it's worth it. Do you notice how congenial they've become? I knew it would work, and I'm so grateful to you. After all, it's your money, child, if you don't mind spending it, trying to warm up those three ice cubes in petticoats. Turn around. Not that I think they ever will warm up. Oh, yes, they will. I've already convinced them to come to the academy one of these days and try a ride on the animals. I don't get it. This concern you have for other folks. I don't get it at all. I met a lot of people in my day, both inside of prisons and outside. But somebody like you, what do you expect to get out of it? Oh, if I can make people happy, it makes me feel good, that's all. Well, what about making yourself happy? Oh, but I am. Very. I'll let you in on a little secret. You're not. And I'm referring to that certain party named Eddie Taylor. You know, I was in love with my probation officer once. I had such a crush on him, it gave me a thrill just to report to his office. But of course, I had to curb any display of affection because, after all, he was my probation officer. But you and this Eddie. How do I look? Don't ask me, ask Eddie Taylor. Dear child, you interfered in my life, so I feel I have a right to interfere in yours. You did something that state prisons, penitentiaries, small jails, and eight parole boards couldn't do. You made an honest woman of it. Of course, there's enough larceny left in me to keep me attractive. But I want to do something for you. May I, sweet? I know what you're going to say. Well, then why don't you do it? I can't. I, I can't now. Not until he's finished his play. Because that's what he wants to do more than anything else in the world. And, and I wouldn't want to... to clutter things up for him. You could help. That's what a woman's for. To make a man think he's successful. Oh, no, no. He, he told me definitely. He works alone. After he's a success in the theater, then maybe... Well, maybe then. Well, I tried to help. But you have. If I were certain, if I were really certain that Eddie wanted me, you know what I mean. The least you can do is to call up that idiot and tell him you're working and where. I'll do it. I'll do it right now. Do you think he'll like me in this outfit? Well, I don't know about him, but a normal male, well, a normal male would be very normal about it. Eddie. I took the liberty of coming here. You don't have to apologize for visiting me. No, I'm not apologizing. I came to say goodbye. Bye. You mean like farewell? I've been wanting to say farewell to everyone. To you, to Mike. Except Mike isn't around. So, farewell, Barry. Farewell, Eddie. And goodbye. 
say you turned down your play. And you're giving up? That, that's not right. You've got to have faith, particularly in yourself. Faith? Yes, faith. And don't make it sound like some cheap commodity flooding the market. I didn't come here to argue, Perry. Let's part as friends. Now we're parting? After I say goodbye, I... I guess the next step is... for us to part. How do you go about it? Well, I wasn't planning on shaking your hand, though, if that's what you mean. Of course not. Or waving so long or slapping you on the back. No. That would be in bad taste. You may fall in love with me now. Thanks. Mr. Gabulian. Uh, yes? I have figured out just how this business should be run. Uh, you see? I've made a graph according to seasonal changes. Excuse please, I go back to sleep. And Mr. Gabulian. Uh, yes? I have made a very detailed study as to why business has been bad up till now. A study she makes. It's easy like pie. When nobody comes in and uses the machine, then business is bad. So far, six months, one people, three people come in, so I know business is bad. I know it, Mrs. Gabulin knows it, and all my relations know it. Now she comes and makes it with pen and paper and tells me that business is bad. Big surprise. Excuse me, please. I go back to sleep. He's upset because I had him print up a thousand handbills to advertise the place. Mandy's going to give them out in various sections of Brooklyn. You think that'll help, huh? Oh, yes. The point is, so few people really know about the Academy. All we have are two regulars, like Captain Jean over there and Robert Bruce McWhorter, who comes in every day to ride across the track. Is he still at it? Huh? How did you know about him? I think I'll take a pony ride. Why, Mr. McWhorter, are you going to take another ride today? Indeed I am. I've been feeling restless all day. And I thought, if no one else is going to use it... Oh, no, Mr. McWhorter. That camel is yours. Thank you. Three more customers. All right, girls, come in. They were a little unwilling at first, but here they are. Oh, I I'm sure you'll all have a perfectly wonderful time. Why shouldn't they have? I just taught them how to shoot craps. They won close to six dollars from me. And the dice were loaded. May I offer you the finest horses in the stable? Oh, two girls take this one. Thank you, Adam. We didn't help her. It's cheaper. Right. Come on over. Miss Girl. Up you go. There we are. Fun. Oh, How did I get me up? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have business like this every day, all day long? Then you'd be completely happy, huh? Almost, Eddie. If only Gabulian would change the name of the place. Yeah, that's a good idea. I've got a name for you. The Golden Horse Academy. The Golden Horse Academy. It's perfect. 
It'd be a good name for a ranch, too. So, let's figure it out. Please. What a ride. Too much business. Just too much business. Yes. You still riding with me? Leave us have no small talk, pal. You better get that horse going again. Mm -hmm. This one you get for free. That's the one I've been waiting for. Well, by this time, Gabulian had enough and decided to sell the joint. And who do you think bought it? Eddie. And you know why? Just to keep Perry working, just to give her a job. Of course, Perry didn't know that Eddie sunk his last 800 bucks in it. Eddie and I figured that this Academy deal would clear up everything. But the place just didn't seem to catch on. Even with Perry running it, and with all the face he had in it. Christmas Eve came along, and Eddie and Perry were only two jumps ahead of the sheriff. Say, what do you think could be happening up there at 11 p.m.? That's Gabulian's place, isn't it? Used to be. It's been called the Golden Horse Academy the past couple of weeks. Think maybe they're having a Christmas party up there? big party. Well, it was supposed to be big. But we wound up just trying to be gay. <laughs> Robert Bruce McWhirter showed up, <laughs> along with a whole gang of Santa Clauses, all members of the Big Brothers of St. Nicholas, South Brooklyn branch. The old boys rode the stuffing out of the menagerie, but the cash register never rang once. Then, Officer Comedy came in. Well, Merry Christmas, Marcus. I'd like to have you meet my friends, Perry and Eddie. How do you do? How do you do, Marcus? 
I said I'd like to have you meet my friends, Perry and Eddie. Oh, uh, how, do you, how do you do and a very merry to you. Uh, I've noticed the lights up here ever since I've been on duty, but I did nothing about it. That's right. Tonight's the night for leaving people alone. Yes. Then I see what looks to me like a crowd of Santa Claus has come into this building. I follow him in. Get the point? Oh, great work. When I saw his eyes pop at the place jumping with Santa Clauses, something snapped in my noggin. Strange, yes. But nothing that would make me report this incident to headquarters. You see, Christmas Eve is a night for leaving people alone. What do you mean there's nothing wrong? Uh, how would it look if a passerby saw them come in and reported it to your superior officer? How would you look if you said you didn't think it was important enough to call the station when you saw a horde of Santa Clauses come in here and take over the riding academy at this time of night? Did you go to check with the sergeant? Is that the sort of thing that happens to you every night? But this is Christmas Eve. Well, does that explain the situation as far as an officer of the law is concerned? Don't let anyone leave. I'm going to call the station. Come with me. Give me the numbers of all the newspapers. Manhattan as well as Brooklyn. Hello? City desk, please. Soda, Pop. Yes, dear. I'll have just a teensy. Well, really, girls, there's a limit to how far we can go. Why? I don't know. Yes. Well, just a few. <laughs> well. Sure you're not drunk, comedy? All right, I'll check on it. I'll check on you at the same time. Sure there's a story in it. Sounds like a lot of human interest. I'll send a man over. Right. Well, if you won't help me, I'll call the police commissioner. I tell you, he does this every Christmas Eve, but he always gets home in town for dinner. Something must have happened to him. He has a newspaper in the Bronx. Well, give it to me. We want complete coverage. Fifty Santa Clauses? This time of the night? Have you got the address? Yes, Alice, I've already called the police. Oh, you have too? What could have happened to them? We just got a tip about a hundred Santa Clauses, all drunk, running wild someplace in Brooklyn. Yes, lady, I got all that. Now, how was your husband dressed? Oh, like Santa Claus, huh? <laughs> Maybe he got stuck down the wrong chimney. <laughs> now, look, lady, don't take it so serious. We'll find your husband all right. <laughs> no sense of humor. <laughs> Jim. Listen to me. Listen to me, all of you. Your wives and your children, your friends and your neighbors, burning up the telephone wires, asking if any of you is behind bars at the police station, or lying all torn to pieces on a hospital bed, or stretched stone dead on a cold slab in the morgue. <laughs> well, are you? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I got a list of names to check on. You lads are going home right away. Big smile now. No, oh, come on, bigger than that. Smile. There we are. You know, um... With this publicity and everything, you have here a pretty valuable piece of property. Well, the Cheever sisters want to buy it. What do you think, Perry? We could always use the money to buy a ranch. In Texas, perhaps. I merely offer it as a suggestion. We'll raise herds of golden horses, Eddie. Real golden horses. Maybe 50 of them to begin with, and, and a, a lot of little golden coats. <laughs> a hundred golden horses, Perry, to begin with. And after that, well, maybe many more. You know, my grandfather used to have several thousand on his ranch. Eddie Taylor, now don't you start pretending. <laughs> And so, Eddie and Perry got their ranch, which is what they both wanted all the time. Now, in Texas, babies come on golden horses. None of that stock business in Texas, no sir. And that whole ranch was loaded with golden horses. You expect me to believe all that? How'd you like the drink? Fine. Didn't even feel him. Hello, Mike. Hello. So 